Hi, everyone, and welcome back to the Hockey Journey Podcast, episode number 113, the Tom Pert Hockey Journey, presented to you by OnlineHockeyTraining.com. I'm your host, Coach Lance Pittman. If you're new here, please make sure you subscribe so you won't miss out on any future episodes. Before we load the train, set out to discover more about a vagabond life, stories from a Minnesota hockey coach, and begin this conversation. If you want to learn more about me, my hockey experiences, what I know, and most importantly, how I've been helping hockey players get really good with a stick and puck, just head on over to OnlineHockeyTraining.com and gain instant access to a 10-part video series where I'll show you everything. Consider it my gift to you. Lastly, if you live in Minnesota or are visiting the state of hockey sometime soon and you want to schedule an in-person off-ice stick skills lesson, I'd love to have the opportunity to show you my little world. Go to SweetHockeyCoach.com, that's SweetHockeyCoach.com, and watch the video on the homepage for instructions. Thanks, and I look forward to working with you sometime soon. I'm super excited about my next guest on the show, Tom Pert, as our paths have crossed over the years, but I really didn't get to know him too well, so I'm looking forward to doing a deep dive into his journey that includes being a former United States Marine, a four-decade hockey coach, and, if that wasn't enough, he's also an author of a book, A Vagabond Life, Stories from a Minnesota Hockey Coach. So we have a lot to talk about. Ladies and gentlemen, please help me in welcoming Tom Pert to the show. Mr. Pert, howdy, and thanks for being here. Thank you, Lance. This is a, this is a great opportunity. I appreciate it. Good. Well, uh, like I said, we've ran into each other over the years just kind of in passing for a couple minutes set a couple pleasantries but never really sat down with you and had a beer and learned about your life um we have something common going on right now i'm up at a resort in ontario called rod and reel and you spent a little time here doing some fishing with our mutual friend chris hansen yep so you know exactly where i am and i'm in a i'm in a good spot <laughs> yes uh, it's a beautiful place up there. It's incredible. Yeah, I don't know what it's like in the summer, but it's pretty quiet and peaceful up here. So we have a lot of ground we can cover with you here today. But how I start all the shows where I'm interviewing someone is I'd like you to rewind the tape and let's take a moment, look in the rearview mirror and go back to the beginning. Where did you grow up? What was your childhood like? Your parents, siblings, friends, your introduction to hockey and other sports? Basically, tell our listeners in a nutshell what the heck it was like growing up, Tom Pert. All right. Well, I grew up in Alexandria, Minnesota. Um, back in the day, our we did not have a night. When I was going to school there, we didn't have an indoor arena yet. So, oh, wow. so <laughs> some of our some of our practices were well, all of our practices were outside during the season. Um, during the early part of the year when we didn't have outdoor ice yet, we'd go to um, Detroit Lakes or Fergus Falls, St. Cloud to practice. And we usually had to get ice at like 11, 10, 11 at night. We'd get home at 1.30. I don't think parents oh. today would, would really be too happy about all that. But back in the day, that's what we did. And then also we'd skate on the lakes and around Alexandria, there's a ton of lakes. And um, I didn't even think about it. I, I tell a story about this in my book, but um, we had deer. I was a goaltender. We had deer hide pads, right? And they yeah. were leather and deer hide, and they were heavy as heck. And as you're skating across a lake and you're hearing the ice cracking behind you, I'm thinking, I didn't think about it then because you're, you know, you're 15, 16, 17 years old, but I'm thinking about it now and I'm like, if I'd gone in the lake and fell through the ice, they wouldn't have found me till spring. It was, I would have right. straight to the bottom. But holy cow. Yeah, we, uh, we survived and you had to be a little bit tougher to be a hockey player at that time. You had to deal with a lot of outdoor weather and, and whatnot, but it was a it was a great time to grow up, and um, I was fortunate enough to be in a class that was exceptional athletes. We won the state football championship my senior year. 
Um, we went to state and I think baseball, we were close in basketball, hockey, not so much. We usually lost in the first round or I think maybe once we, in my four years in playing varsity hockey, we made it to the second round of the playoffs. But for the most part, you know, we were playing more, uh, Moorhead and uh, Deep River and some of those teams and they were better. They had more experience and just kind of was one of those things. Well, we got another something in common because the one thing that we never did was make it or play in the state high school hockey tournament. But I know that uh, that's a, a place that you and I both uh, go and watch that historic tournament almost every single year. Yes, we do. It's awesome. I've been going since I was uh, uh, 15 years old. So it's been wow. a long time. Yeah. I remember uh, my parents got divorced when I was going into fifth grade and we lived with them for a year and a half or something. But anyways, they let me stay home, watch the state high, state high school hockey tournament. Um, Cause I had never gone before, but uh, they let me watch it on, on TV. And I did, you know, you just dream of getting there one day. I remember yeah. who was that Reggie something from uh, Columbia Heights. They were really good back then. Reggie Miracle. Reggie Miracle. Yeah. Yes. Yes. <laughs> it was so. I, the only reason. So there was two goaltenders I remember from you know, well three actually. The first was Pete Wasilovich from International Falls. I, I idolized him. I thought he was just phenomenal. And then, um, the Reggie Miracle was one. And then Mickey Pickens. He played at Hop or uh, Bloomington. What was the middle one? So it was Jefferson and Jefferson Cannon. What was the middle? I'm drawing a blank. Know. Yeah. Anyway, yeah, he had white skates. So of course I had to convince my parents to to get me white goalie skates. <laughs> and they cost sixty three dollars at the time. Now this is nineteen seventy three or something. You you yeah. can't even buy new skates anymore for that. <laughs> so would you growing up would you 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 said you put your pads on but but were those for organized practices with your team i mean when you were just going to screw around would you suit up and play goalie because i'm sure <laughs> pucks didn't feel too good uh you know absorbing those in that cold weather all the time yeah um we didn't so it was organized practice because we were um we'd skate at the pond with there was a new uh a late little pond called Noonan's Pond in about three blocks from my house. And we skated there all the time. We'd be there and um, even before practice or after, <clears throat> excuse me, after practice, we would, we would um, be skating. And it, because I, had, I came to hockey a little bit late, Lance, I was uh, uh, one of my best friends, Bill Blanchard, lived down the block from me. He's like, you got to play hockey. I'm like, oh, okay. So I started playing hockey, but I think it was because he didn't want to be a goaltender. So I, I got to be the goaltender. And actually, I loved it. It was, um, I don't know. It was, I had a little bit of ADD. So I think it helped uh, with my thinking about um, concentration at different times. So, yeah. How do you explain, explain a little more on that? What do you mean by that? So when you're a goaltender, you don't have to focus like constantly. So yeah. you're you have times where the puck's in the other end, you can you can have a little mental break. And uh, my coach was always yelling at me to pay attention because I'd kind of wander out of the net a little bit. <laughs> yeah. I guess, I don't know. We didn't talk about ADD back then. Nobody really knew what it was. Um, in school, I went to special math class because I struggled with math, those kind of things. Yeah. So they, I just I had trouble concentrating. But um, later, uh, when I learned a few strategies on how to deal with it, it helped, and you know, life was good. But yeah, back in the day, you didn't you didn't talk about those things too much. You were just not paying attention in class. People nuns yeah. would get after you. So yeah. And then there's uh, another thing that there really wasn't 
much known of back then was concussions. Yes, absolutely. Know, so interestingly um, enough, um, when I was a junior, my high school got a tackling machine. Did you, you played football, didn't you? I did, yeah. Yeah, and so th- it was on a spring-operated thing, and the coach would pull a lever, and he could pull would be either 100 pounds, that was one spring, 200 pounds was the uh, left spring, and then 300 if it was both. And uh, so this thing would come at you while you were coming at it. The problem was we were inexperienced. We were just high schoolers. And the only people that had this was the Vikings, I think. Um, And then it would hit you. (laughs) And we had probably, I, I got a concussion and sprained my neck because I was too, my head was too close to the, to the dummy coming at me we had a lot of guys that tried to shy away from it and they'd separate their shoulder that thing lasted one year and then it was gone <laughs> but uh yeah. That. yeah yeah but back then you'd uh, they called it oh you got your bell rung get back in there and yeah long way from your heart yep <laughs> <laughs> oh man just that mentality so um Tell me a little bit about you, brothers, sisters. What, what's your uh, family? I what have was that growing six, up. I have six older sisters. I had a what? Bro- yeah. Um, ironically, Ooh. my dad had six sisters as well. No brothers. Oh wow. Yeah. So uh, probably why I never had kids. <laughs> <Not sure. laughs> um, but uh, just didn't work out to have kids. I I love kids. I. Have, a lot of great nephew and nieces, but uh, just never worked out for me. Um, I was married for five long years, but that that's a different story. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, I so I grew up with six older sisters. I had a brother that died at birth um, just before me, so um, I kind of came along, and my mother uh, favored me a little bit. My sisters always struggled with that, but they, they love me. I, but I grew up with yeah. seven mothers. It was, you know, one of those things. Yeah. And um, what, was the clo- what was the closest one to you in age? Uh, she was three and a half years older. Okay. Okay. And there's some stories in the book about <laughs> how I kind of tortured her at times. <laughs> we got along. She was, she was a good, yeah. But uh, so, my dad, so uh, dad had six sisters too, but he grew up in in the depression, and uh, he actually uh, we just found out. Well, we knew about it, but we saw a uh, up north and like around Cloquet, and up there there's a highway one, and he helped build that. Um, and there's a plaque that has all the guys that worked on its name on it. So, oh, cool. Yeah, it was kind of cool. And he, so, ironically, he was uh, he was in Pearl Harbor, and got out in April of forty one, and they, of course, they bombed in December of forty one. So he dodged it, and then I went in the Marine Corps right after uh, Vietnam, about six months, seven months after Nam. So I dodged it. So we were fortunate. So did you ever? We'll come back to the the Marine Corps in a little bit. Did you uh, did you play after um, high school? Yeah, so uh, I went into the Marine Corps right away out of high school. Um, okay. Actually, I was at a bar, and a friend, teammate, hockey teammate, got in a little ball, brawl on the ice, um, not on the ice, on the dance floor. And I went to help him, and the next thing I knew, I was in the hospital. A guy had busted a beer bottle over my head and another guy kicked me in the jaw and I think the Marine Corps recruiter was uh, reading the paper because next day after I got out of the hospital he was on my doorstep (laughs) and it was the right at the right time and so I joined the Marine Corps but um, yeah after that so I get out I actually got knifed when I was in the Marine Corps and uh, you got knifed yeah, by another Marine. I was in Okinawa, Japan, and we had a little, again, a bar. I got to stay out of bars, I think. Anyway, uh, it was a yeah. little 
little bump in the bar, nothing big. But he was he had a little chip on his shoulder and he wanted to prove he was tough. So the bouncers broke it up. Everything's fine. He left. I thought everything was over. When I was walking back to my barracks, um, I heard a rustle in the bushes and I turned and there's a guy swinging at me and I thought he was just taking a punch at me. And I went to deflect his his arm and I went to grab whatever his arm, you know, grab his arm or whatever. And he uh, had a knife in it. And so I got 63 stitches in my palm. Lucky I didn't tear any tendons. Um, but uh, yeah, that was, uh, that was a wake up call there. So, so anyway, so long story short, um, after I got out of the Marine Corps, I wanted to go, I wanted to play hockey again. And so I, went to Masabi Community College in Virginia, Minnesota, because where else should you go to play hockey but the range? Um, We went to the national championship. We took second. We lost in overtime in the championship game, and it was a phenomenal experience. And uh, then, you know, you know the range. If you're not a ranger, if you weren't born there, you're never really a ranger. So, after one year, then I transferred to St. Cloud State. I played there for three years, but I had a really uh, aus- inauspicious career. I broke my tailbone my first year, tore ligaments in my knee my second year, and broke my ankle my third year. So I thought the good Lord was saying, it's time to do something different. So I started <laughs> I got a question going back to the Marines. Yep. Uh, so you said that you were, it sounds, sounded like you were maybe needing some direction yes. in your later teenage years. Do you think that's pretty common with a lot of uh, men and women who go into the military at a, a young age like that, that they just haven't been able to figure it out and they need some discipline or some, some change in their life? Yes, I really think so. And it, it really helped me grow up quite a bit. Uh, when I went into college, I was you know, two, three years older than my classmates. So I felt like I was a little bit further ahead. And I also was able to to study a little better. And I was able to um, uh, focus on what I really wanted. So yeah, Marine Corps changed my life totally. That's uh, awesome. Um I want to transition now, if that's okay, yep. since you no uh, went through your college journey. I didn't know that. I, I feel for you with the injuries because that, uh, man, it's just part of the game and it sucks. But, you know, how did how did you get into coaching? What, what happened there? I mean, you just finished college again. And then, you know, when you left the Marine Corps, you didn't do anything else uh, with the military. You just you retired from that. Yeah, so I actually got out on a medical because of the hand, and I had some, uh, one of the things about the Marine Corps particularly is that boot camp, they, I don't want to say indoctrinate you, but they pretty much convince you that you're invincible. You're you're a Marine, you're, you know, we Marines kind of think of them, well, once a Marine, always a Marine, right? So they think yeah. they're, they're a little tougher, a little higher in the food chain than others than the army navy air force etc and so to be knifed by another marine was was a hard it kind of messed up my head but i kind of just stuck it all away in the back of my brain and when i retired from coaching it all came out again and and i saw a counselor and the counselor's like yeah you just shut this all away um and didn't want to deal with it until you know, whenever, and then I had some anxiety and whatnot. So anyway, long story short, I got out of the the Marine Corps and, and didn't really do much more um, service-wise for probably, you know, while I was coaching. And then afterwards, I'm getting more involved and got reconnected with a couple of guys I was in the Marine Corps with. And, and this thing with Chris up in you know, Suneros was phenomenal. There was vets there that we'd sit down and talk about our experiences, and it was a really incredible experience. 
Fantastic. All right, let's let's go to where how'd you get into coaching? Okay, so you got like four decades under your belt. Yeah. I um I wanted to coach. My uncle coached in international balls. He coached um track and golf and I think he helped with football a little bit. But anyway, and I admire admired him. My dad didn't coach. He, you know, raising seven kids was a, he had to work, but he uh, he always loved uh, sports, and actually, I found out after he passed away that he was an all-star. Um, this was, you know, there was no war going. There was a war going on, but the U.S. wasn't in it, and before Japan bombed us, and so they had to have something for the guys in Hawaii to do. And he was an all-star um, football player, and uh, wow. yeah. So anyway. Um, he always was supportive of my being in athletics, but um, didn't uh, he didn't have time to really coach or you know do a lot that way, respect. But so, long story short, I always wanted to coach. I um, put out an application to about six schools, and Armstrong and Cooper were were one of them, and the. The weekend or the week before the season started in 1983, um, <clears throat> I got a call from Bruce Johnson at Armstrong and said, um, we, you know, school district got funding to start a, um, or to have a, have another go- coach. And um, because you're, you were a goaltender, we need a goalie coach your job will be coach the JV help with the varsity and then coach the goaltenders. So, yeah. okay. So I interview on a Friday right before the season started, you know, right before practice started and on Monday. And then he, t- uh, Bruce told me that he would have, he had one more guy to interview on Sunday night. Now, because I was in love with hockey completely, um, I was repping that fall just to uh, get on the ice a little bit. And, you know, I didn't know if I'd get a coaching job. So I thought, well, you know, I'll, I'll stay involved. And if I ref for a while, maybe that'll be good. And so anyway, long story short, the guy that he was interviewing was the coach of one of the two teams of the game. I was in uh, repping on Sunday night and, uh, <laughs> So he calls me Monday morning and he says, you're, uh, you're hired. We'd like to hire you. Um, practice starts this afternoon. And by the way, you missed two calls in the corner last night. <laughs> funny. But uh, so I started that day. My first duty as a hockey coach ever in my 40 plus years and 50 plus years involved in the game was uh, to cut a goaltender I'd never seen play or stop a puck. <laughs> wow. Yeah, but Bruce said he was, you know, he was testing me, see how I'd handle it. <clears throat> I did learn that if you're going to cut a kid, and I, I talked to Ken Staples, and I know he played for Kenny and respected him greatly. He was always <clears throat> one that believed that you met with a kid in person. You don't put a list up. And and I always respected that because, <clears throat> excuse me, that's a tough thing for a kid, especially, you know, this kid was a sophomore, maybe a ninth grader in high school. That's tough to get cut down to midgets at that time. And so, right. uh, but yeah, it was, uh, cutting kids was the worst thing involved in coaching besides dealing with some crazy parents but that's another story that is another story <laughs> no i <clears throat> i had a 17 year coaching career and it is that that part's hard cutting a kid uh not getting as much ice time maybe yep uh there, there, there's this there's so many things that you know it's you got to make those tough decisions but yep um and that's why I, I guess I really gravitated towards the skill development side of hockey. Mm-hmm. Um, Cause I, I didn't, I didn't enjoy that part of coaching. 
Yeah. Um, but, you know, I guess I didn't really want to be a coach then, that type of team coach. Right, right. Um, more individual and small groups. But a lot of So people, are you so – sorry. I'm sorry. I, I've noticed that a lot of people – uh, Winnie Broad on the on the girls' side of the game, she's that way mm-hmm. too. She doesn't want to coach a team, but she's really good at you know individual skills and and that kind of thing. So and yeah. you are too. So yeah, there's you either have that or you have the people like myself who I didn't always feel that I was the best individual coach, but I was I was good at like in game kind of adjustments and then also um i tr- i tried to treat my players like i would like to be treated so i got to know them a little better and understood and enhance is one of those ex- um kids that i was always attracted not attracted i was driven to help him because he had so much heart and uh so much desire and he wasn't the most skilled player on our team. I mean, Armstrong had some really good teams at that time, but he, he had more heart than damn near any kid on there. So that's why I was, uh, that was, that's the fun part of coaching is when you connect with a kid. So. Isn't that funny? Because um, when my parents split up and we moved in with my grandparents in New Hope, Minnesota, Chris was the first person that I met. That's awesome. And we're still friends. And we're still friends today. So I guess we both picked a good one to yep, we know, did. attach ourselves to. <laughs> so um, I guess we're getting, we're probably close to the halfway point. <coughs> not, <coughs> not that I have a time limit on it, but um, I'd like to talk about your book, A okay. Vagabond Life. Stories from a Minnesota hockey coach. Uh, talk a little bit about that process. When did you decide that you wanted to become an author? And what was that process like? How long did it take you to, and just so the listeners know, as I just started reading in it a little bit up here, just to get a little background. It's a bunch of just short stories that are just really interesting. So talk a little bit about how that became a reality for you. So it, uh, I always wanted, as I was coaching throughout the years, we'd go to the coaching clinics or we'd be sitting around having a beer after a game or whatever. And I always said, you know, some of these things that happen in game uh, and, you know, you played for so long and you were at a higher level, but you know that every kid plays a game because they love playing. They love playing. They love competing. They love being with their friends. And even though when you played pro, it was more a business, it's still right down to the bottom. People play because they love the game, you know. And uh, so I said, I really want to write some stories about my experiences, just the good and the bad. You know, maybe um, highlight the good a little bit more because I – I believe I'm a positive person and want to be it. But there's some sad stories, some bad stories, some crazy parent stories that you'll get to when you get to the to Tino section of the book later. But uh, uh, so it's the, the pandemic happens and I'm frustrated with politics and life and sitting at home. I'm a social person, so. If I'm home too much, it it drives me crazy. So I just started, I'm sitting in front of the TV watching a hockey game, and I just started typing on Facebook a story that would pop in my brain. Um, For instance, one time the the Gophers were playing, and it was an outdoor game. and, uh, And I thought to myself, when I grew up, we didn't think it was such a great thing to play outdoors because we had to play all our games outdoors or not all of them, but you know, all our home games. And now it's like revered because it's nostalgic and all that. And that's great. Yeah, It's not a problem, but back in the day. So I just wrote a story about that. And then I started telling stories about, you know, like maybe about Chris or about Armstrong, about 
uh, Roosevelt, where I got my first head coaching job, and uh, about making the state attorneys and how people were critical because they're like, oh, it's tier two. And I, and yeah, you played at the Met Sports Center, but it was half empty. And I said, you know what? My guys looked up in those stands and they didn't see it half empty. They looked up and said, we've never played in front of this many people in our lives. So right. it's all perspective, right? So I just started writing stories and putting them on Facebook and I called them, um, I call them stories from a vagabond life. Just, uh, you know, nothing major. I didn't even think about a title or anything. Um, oh, no, I said stories from a coronavirus um, vagabond life or something like that. Anyway, yeah. long story short, it happens that some friends contacted me and said, we love your stories. Why don't you put them in a book? And I thought, oh, why not? So it ended up taking me four years to write this thing. Um, I have some friends that uh, connected me with some publishers and my publishers out of Winnipeg. And um, so it just was uh, kind of one thing led to another. And I was, they wanted to, so you have to, there's three ways you publish. The first is you're like John Grisham or James Patterson, where they pay for everything. You know, you're a big shot. Um, then there's where you actually pay the publishing company to edit, uh, at least one edit. I thought it was more than that, but one edit. And then um, they'll um, do some of the publication or um, publicity. And they'll do um, some website stuff and that kind of thing. And um, you can pay more. So I paid about four grand to get this thing published. And then they'll pay more. If you pay more, then they'll do more. But it was at the limit of my what I wanted to put in financially at that point. So anyway, yeah. um, I was talking to another friend of mine who said, hey, I got a guy, you can talk to him. He published a book called Bandy Chronicles. His name's Chris Middlebrook. And so in talking to Chris, he said, you know what? I would love to edit this for you. I'm like, great. I'm thinking I'll pay Chris later, um, save up some money, and then be able to pay him, and and we'll go from there. Well, he went through it five times and um, just did a phenomenal job. And um, then he wouldn't accept anything, to, <laughs> any payment, because back in the day, uh, his daughter was a senior in high school, and I was helping with the girls' uh, senior classic, which is a little tournament at the end of the year. And then I was involved with Minnesota hockey, and I was running the girls' 16 and 17 program uh, for the high performance program. And then we had an NIT tournament national invitational tournament thing and so it ended up that uh his daughter was an all-state player that year but her high school coach didn't nominate her for anything after the season and uh kevin mcmullen a good friend of mine called me and said hey there's this girl and i didn't know her i mean i knew of her because she was a good player but i didn't know her dad or anything well it turns out and i'm not pumping my own tires but when you're a coach you you can decide to do things for kids that you do because it's the right thing to do for kids it's not a I didn't expect to get anything out of this I just this girl's getting worked over because for whatever reason the coach didn't like her and that's not fair because she's a really talented player so I got her on the team um, my team at the senior classic and then she got chosen to go to the NIT tournament and then she got a division one scholarship. Now she probably had that anyway, but I don't know through the whole process it happened and she ended up playing out East and then she went to um, Europe and played and she was a great, she was a great kid. And then Chris wanted to pay that back because that happened. And I, so he hasn't accepted any payment for me, no matter how much I've tried to push it on him. 
Wow, that's a great story. And yeah, you just don't know how, you know, when that connection is going to happen. And you were just doing something out of the, you know, goodness of your heart. Exactly. And so, you know, going back to our mutual friend, Chris, I didn't know some of the things he was going through when he was in high school. He didn't talk about yeah. it you know, issues with his dad and, and whatnot. He always came to the rink and he always worked his butt off and he always was pleasant and positive. And I didn't know until we were driving up to Canada that his dad was, you know, had some issues and, and that kind of thing. So you're right. You, you have impact on kids that you don't even know you have an impact on as a coach. Yeah. So. Um, you here, I had <clears throat> Taylor Williamson mm -hmm. on the show. She played at the UE Dyna girl. She now works with Adam Oates and I had her on the show uh, a little while ago and she coached at, uh, with Dino or dad at Wyzetta high school for three or four years, I think. Yep. Yep. And then she kind of, she kind of got out of the coaching and now is working for Adam Oates doing personal training and stuff like that. But one of the questions that I asked her, and like you said, you have four decades of experience, but an uncomfortable uh, thing that players have to go through at times. And it could be, you know, even as young as squirts, you know, nine, 10 years old, uh, where you got to go talk to the coach. Any advice you can give players on how to approach that? Yeah, so, and it, it's it's always been my experience that if you go to a coach, now different coaches are different, but if you go to a coach and you're like, why aren't I playing? Then they get defensive right away. But if you yeah. go and you say, what can I do to get more ice time? What can I, what do I need to improve on? You put it on yourself that you're coming for advice on what to do. And most coaches, I'd say 99% of the coaches will have some reason that they're not playing you. If, you, if you're really good, if you're Lance Bitlick, they're going to play you. <laughs> and I know you had some issues later in your career, but it's, it's – players that are really good play and – coaches want to win and I think it's pretty rare that a coach will have a favor a favorite that plays instead of somebody if they're not as good as that player so anyway if yeah. you go and you say listen I what can I do to play more then the coach can give you some some things that they can you know that you can do and it just it takes the emphasis off the coach and, and maybe doesn't make them feel uh, defensive because we're all here yeah. after all. And, and uh, you know, if, if a kid came to you and said, listen, I, I, I paid all this money and you're not you're not helping me. That puts you a little bit on the defensive. But if you if he comes to you and says, you know. I, I don't feel like I'm improving enough. What do I need to do? It's just it's just the, turning the the narrative a little bit around. And most coaches want to help kids. That's that's why we get involved. You're not making a ton of money. We're not no. Texas football where they're getting paid a you know six figures to coach the stupid game. <laughs> you know, <laughs> at least that. You might be. I don't know, Lanny, but I'm not, I never did. <laughs> no, 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 no. Um, well, that's great advice. Uh, I I tried to do the same thing if someone's going on, you know, being a healthy scratch is what can I do uh, to earn more ice time, more shifts, more minutes? Uh, and then I would, uh, I don't know who gave me this advice, but it was guys like you. I remember being in Ottawa and Craig Ramsey. Mm -hmm. uh, he would work with me, you know, after at the at, at the end of practice and stuff like that. But I initiated that. What do I got to work on? Can you help me with it? Yes. Yep. And then you still may not get what you want, but at least they know that you're part of the team and you're you're doing whatever you can to be the best version 
of yourself to, to help the team be successful. So, yeah. Yeah. Uh, great advice. Um, one thing I noticed flipping through your book again, a vagabond life stories from a Minnesota hockey coach are, you got a bunch of quotes in here. Yeah. Do you have a favorite quote that you like to, to use with players? Yes. Um, my favorite quote is by Lou Holtz. Yeah, football guy, but he was, uh, I always respected him. And it says, life is 10% what happens to you and 90% how you respond to it. Oh, I like that. Yeah. And that's, I mean, everyone. And so, Lance, when I was coaching, I always had a, a player parent meeting at the beginning of the year. And I'd always say, listen, and it, it was particularly true with girls, but it's true with boys too. Every one of us is going to go through something. Your parents got divorced when you were in high school. You didn't anticipate that. You didn't love it. You know, Chris had his mom and dad had issues. Um, every one of us, maybe you have a brother that dies or you have a sister that gets into drugs or who knows what. Or as I told my players at Tatino Grace and other places, St. Ben's, you, um, Maybe maybe your daughter gets pregnant. I mean, that's something you can't anticipate, and you can't. You, you no matter how you try, you're not going to be able to change it. Um, so it's what you do afterwards. It's how you respond to it. We're going to lose hockey games. How do we respond afterwards? We're going to have a situation where maybe the ref makes a bad call that we feel is a bad call. But he sees it one way and we see it a different way. How do you deal with that afterwards? Do you allow a loss to devastate you or do you pick yourself up and, and go on? And um, so, you know, I got divorced when I was down at St. Mary's. And it was like a week or two weeks into the school year. And I'm like devastated. I didn't expect it, didn't know it was coming. And. I told the guys, I'm like, this is why I love this quote, because 10% is what happened to you, and 90% is how you deal with it. You got to pick yourself up. You got to go on. You got to figure out how to get by it. You had a situation in Ottawa where you had to figure out, what do I do? How do I, how do I overcome this? Do I work harder? And, you know, it's the thing that always I always look at this. It's not like you were – a marginal player. You were a phenomenal player. I was I intimidated by you my whole <laughs> coaching career because I thought you were phenomenal. You know, you were one of those guys that was like top 5% in the state of the Minnesota. And I just respected you, but I also was like, he's, he's really good. I don't know what I could offer him in any respect. So... Well, and then, I think a lot of times, like what you were saying, uh, sorry to interrupt, but no, that, that okay. you're you know you're dealing with players that maybe don't have a you know uh, a person that gives them positive advice, right? And stuff like that at home, so they rely on coaches. And I always every you know college pro, there's always one one guy that you connect with or gal. Yeah. Um, so it, it, it's impactful, but again, this goes to we're just doing the right thing on a consistent basis, and you hope that it helps the kid. And yep. what else can you do? What else can you do? Yep, exactly. So you're 40 years of coaching. 40 years of coaching, um, how much you, it's, you mentioned both boys and girls. Did you, were you flipping back and forth a lot? Did you coach boys more at the beginning? Because I know you started off with Bruce. How did that kind of Yeah, morph? so so I coached uh, with Bruce for six years, learned a lot about how to coach. I mean, he was really good with practices and running different drills and stuff. And then um, I learned how some things not to do as a coach. So that was a very – very good experience for me. I love the kids. That was part of it. Um, the guys at Armstrong were, I would have, would have liked uh, this kid named Lance Pitlick to be on our team, but you know, Hey, but you know, 
I I don't remember if you know uh, Daryl Lindemann. Oh yeah, yeah. So I reconnected with Daryl years later, and I we uh, Gary Stefano and I ran a North uh, Lake North hockey school one summer, and Daryl was out there skating, and just a great kid, and his kids are awesome, and so anyway, there were a lot of good kids at Cooper too. Um, so anyway, I lost my train of thought. Um, oh, so I, and then I went to Roosevelt. I coached there for five years. I went to Europe and coached pro hockey. Uh, yeah, it was kind of D3 type <laughs> pro hockey, but it was fun. It was a good year. And then, uh, came home, coached at Augsburg with Ed Saga said his last year. And then these are all boys teams. These are all boys teams so far, yep, right? Yep. All men, okay. boys so far. Then I get um, a year where I'm kind of in flux. My mother died in 96. Um, and that was the year I was at Augsburg. So I'm like the next year, Ed retired then. And uh, they hired Mike Schwartz, which was a good move. He was a good coach. Um but he, he had his own guys, so that's fine. So I, I coached at Buffalo and Wyzetta working with the goaltenders. So I was halftime at each place, volunteer. Uh, yeah. And this was boys again. And then the next year, girls hockey started at Wright County, which was Buffalo, Delano, Rockford. It was like seven schools. At the same time, my best friend up in St. Ben's was a soccer coach and they started hockey there. So I would run practice in Buffalo. I was a head coach in Buffalo and I would run practice in Buffalo or Delano, jump in my car, drive up to St. Ben's and practice from nine to 11 at night at Richmond ice arena and then head home. I, wow. I don't know. I couldn't do it now, but back then it was, but that was all women. That was girls and women. Um, it took me. So then I coached. St. Mary's was the, the uh, last time I coached men strictly during the season. Now, during the summer and uh, spring, fall, I worked with men, you know, throughout and boys. Um, but primarily the last uh, 15 years or so, I coached women and, and girls. So I coached. um Six years at St. Ben's, coached my niece there, which was awesome. And then um, went to Ohio, actually, for a year and coached at a prep school with girls. And then came oh, wow. back, coached at Augsburg for four years with the women, did a year at St. Mary's with the men, and then went to Titino Grace, where I ended up my career six years there. So, And how long have you been out of coaching now? Since uh, 2015, so I had a car accident in like 2004 or five, right in there, and I've had uh, four surgeries out of that thing. I had shoulders, thumb, and then two back surgeries. So after my second back surgery, it was pretty evident that skating was going to be dangerous because if I go down, you know, I have my bottom three discs fused, so uh, decided it was time. We all got to walk around a little more careful nowadays at our yes, age. We do. <laughs> and Chris and I, Chris and I up here, we just say we're rocking it at a medium pace, no faster, <laughs> no slower. <laughs> so how do you occupy your days now, Tom? Well, actually, uh, ironically, I'm into a second book. I'm writing a second book. Oh, and wow. the tentative title is called The Boy in the Pond, and it's about a 15-year-old boy. It's a fictional account of uh, some true events about a 15 year old boy who skates on the local pond um, to escape the fact that his mother is an alcoholic and they have these massive arguments um, and he can't deal with it and doesn't know how to deal with it. So it's, it's a process of how he learns to reconnect with her, love her, and in the process figure out that you can't fix people so he learns to forgive himself because he held this against himself all his life <laughs> what's the timeline you got for that one 
Well, ironically, I was just up. One of my best friends, uh, his mother passed away at 99, and I was at the funeral, and my old hockey coach was there, and he's 82. And uh, I don't – he's got COPD, so I don't know how much longer he'll be with us. Um, So I've kind of pumped it up a little bit. The first one took me four years. Uh, This one, uh, because I learned a lot about how you – can um do the process of like so for instance what happened is they they give you six months to do your book once you start and you pay the money or whatever and then okay. after that they charge you a 100 bucks a month if you're not done so the editing process took the longest and so learning from that i'm like i'll get it done get the edits done and then start the process. Gotcha. So that'll go better. But uh, yeah, I'm hoping like maybe within a year. Gotcha. What is, so just talk a little bit about your process. How much time or do you budget to sit down and uh, bang out some words? I tr- so it's ironic. I do it two, one or two ways. So I'll sit down in the, at the computer and do it, you know, like maybe an hour during the day. If I have a day, you know, a day where I'm not running around like crazy. Um, But beyond that, I might be at a hockey game in between periods and something will ding in my head and I'll go to notes on my phone and start typing. So it's a it's a little bit or maybe I'm watching a, a movie or something and something triggers a memory. And so I'll I'll write then um and then tra- then you know you can just copy and paste and put it into your book so yeah it's, and then i go back my problem my thing is is that when i if i've left it for a couple of days then i go back and now i got to reread through it and i'm changing things so that's the process that takes a little bit longer because you want it perfect and you know all of a sudden yeah. something doesn't look right or whatever Awesome. Well, uh, I look forward to finishing up this current one. And then when you get the the next one out, uh, I'll enjoy reading that as well. Maybe it'll be a year from now and I'll read it up here. Awesome. Uh, (laughs) So I think the last couple things here, and we'll wrap this up, but uh, where can people find out some more information about you and where they can get the book? So uh, Uh, Vagabond. Vagabond Life uh, Stories from a Minnesota Hockey Coach. The best place to purchase the book or find find the book is either Amazon or on their website and or Barnes & Noble on their website. You can go to Freeze and Press and find it there, um, but they charge almost the cost of the book to ship it, which I've complain to them vehemently i'm like you guys are killing me but people are finding it on amazon and if you have amazon prime it's you know free shipping so it's a much much better deal there um or i have copies so i'm gonna do a couple of book signings i'm hoping to sign uh set one up with the wild at the wild game at a wild game or two and then also at a couple of gopher games if i can so I'm working okay. on those. And then um, I'm going to go up to Alexandria, my hometown. I'm uh, There's a doubleheader in Alec with uh, Fergus Falls. And there's some Fergus Falls stories in my book. And um, so I'm hoping to, uh, well, I will be up there January 9th to do a couple of, a couple of book signings. So that'll be fun. Okay. Um, any, that's all. Yeah, that's going to be awesome. Um, what do you have a website? Is there any social media that you could, uh, send my way that I can, uh, add to the description and then I'll, I'll put it, um, the Amazon links, or if you can send that to me too, that'd be awesome. Yeah, I can send you that. Um, the, I'm working on the website right now. So one of the things that I, and you noticed, um, I didn't have any pictures in there. I originally had pictures in there. And so the book was probably twice as long as it 
as it is now because I had one of the things. This is a funny thing, but and Bruce kind of got me started on this from Armstrong, but he just kept the number seven from that was his number growing up. He kept the number seven jersey for every set of jerseys he purchased. Well, I've been at 13 different stops along my hockey career, uh, at least coaching wise. And so I kept the number 27, which was my, uh, I loved Jill Malash, the goaltender for the North Stars, and he was 27. So I thought that was cool. And so I had 27 in college and then beyond. And um, so I've kept the number 27 for every team I've coached for. Um, some, I couldn't get the number 27, but I have the jersey. So it's been, uh, so I have a whole closet full of jerseys and I, had a picture of each jersey. Like if I told a story about Armstrong, I'd have a picture of an Armstrong jersey on it. And uh, they told me, well, you need permission or you need, if you didn't take it. I said, well, I took the picture of these. Well, it needs to be higher resolution. And then I talked to my editor and he's like, maybe put them on a website and then get rid of all of that. Um, and there was, you know, I had a, Chris, a picture of Chris and after his story and Mark Marilla. So, I, I just um, I'm going to put those on the website because you don't need permissions. Um, and that was the thing with the, the quotes too, Lance is that I, I was a quote guy. So every day at practice, I had a quote on the practice schedule and then I'd make a player come up, read the quote to the whole group. And this did two things. One, I made sure that everybody heard the quote or read the quote, knew the quote. And usually it was pertaining to that week's opponent or something that was happening in the world that day or whatever. And then um, it also then helped like kids get up in front of talk their group and talk a little bit because I wanted them to learn that you have to communicate. So when I did the quotes and the, the publisher came back and said, well, you need, you know, maybe there was a quote from you. I didn't have any, but maybe there was, I'd have to get to you and get permission from you written to print it. Well, if somebody has been dead, like Plato for over a hundred thousand years, <laughs> you can, you can do that because their intellectual property has got a limit on of 75 years. So, um, I, uh, had to redo quotes so that took a long time too but it kind of was i don't know it adds to the book i think a little bit um but anyway getting back to the to the website i'm working with um Friesen press because part of my path as they call it was a, a website so that will be out i hoping within a week or so long story but <laughs> all right my friend i think that that is a wrap uh like i said if you can uh, take a moment send me um your stuff and even when you like, when you get your website finished if you think about it uh let me know because then i can update the yep. description so people can get that um i want to thank you first for your service when you're in the marines thank um, you, sir. Really appreciate that. I want to thank you for taking the time and being on the Hockey Journey podcast. I want to congratulate you on writing a book. Pretty amazing. I did a stat. It's like, I don't know, there's maybe 16% of people or 23% of people uh, actually start writing a book, but only 4% even get halfway. Really? Wow. <laughs> so. Yeah, and I think there there was one other stat I didn't write it down, but you know, at some point in time in someone's life, that over fifty percent of people in this world think that they have a story that should be written in a book. Um, you know, because of all their stuff they've been through. But anyways, and you got one in the the work that's going to keep you uh, busy during the summer, and I'm sure watching a little hockey, but. Lastly, thanks for your contribution to the game of hockey for over four decades. Uh, a lot of that was volunteer work, so really thank you. And then, you know, passing on your experiences and wisdom to the, the kids over the years uh, with one thing in mind, and that's just trying to help them along this journey. So thanks again for being here, Tom. 
Thank you, bud. Well, that concludes another episode of the Hockey Journey Podcast. I can't thank you enough for stopping by and listening. I hope you enjoyed meeting Tom Pert and hearing his hockey journey. I say it over and over and over again. Everyone's hockey journey is different, but when the dust settles and you look back on what actually happened during a player or coach's entire hockey career, they are all pretty similar, filled with the ugly, the challenges, and the greatest feelings and experiences ever. Lastly, if you think there's someone in your circle of family and friends that might like this episode as well, please share it with just one person. It will really help me in growing this hockey community. Again, I appreciate you being here. Don't forget to subscribe, rate, or submit a review. I hope to see you back here soon. And do me a favor, make someone close to you smile today. All the best, my friends.